Hello everyone and welcome to this week's Music Roundup. In some senses it's a significant occasion because this is the last day for which I'd programmed any music. Um, I've decided music on a monthly basis and of course I haven't had to do that for this coming May because we're still in lockdown. So it looks as if for the end of April, having had a busy Holy Week, we were going to have a slightly more relaxed day of music on this particular occasion, this coming Sunday. Um, so the music I'm going to talk about is actually quite simple, but it does lead us on also to um, some further listening. Now, the main composer of the day is Charles Villers Stanford, great English composer of the late 19th century, early 20th. Um, and he wrote most of the music that I've put down for this coming Sunday. Um, but the introit is by Tallis. So Tallis, the um, contemporary William Byrd, Elizabethan composer, he and Byrd were both recusant Catholics. And I've talked a little bit about the style of this music before, um, so we're just revising this topic slightly. Um, there's some speculation about how devout they were really as Catholics. Both Byrd and Tallis wrote music in Latin and in English, so pleasing both the Protestant and Catholic churches. And of course, they both lived through several reigns of several monarchs um, who switched faith each time. So in some senses, um, there was actually quite a wide market for them. When it came to Elizabeth I's reign, which was considerably longer than that of her two siblings, Edward VI and Bloody Mary, um, they found themselves in a much more consistent period musically. And Elizabeth I was a Protestant, not as Puritan as Edward VI, but uh, she was still part of the new Church of England, as founded by her father, Henry VIII. Um, and so following on from the previous Protestant monarchs, she uh, expected music in the church to be sung in English. But Tallis and Bird were such good composers, and she was such a fan of their music, and a musically literate queen as well, that she did something very unusual, which was to grant them a publishing monopoly. So Bird and Tallis were suddenly the only two composers in England who were allowed to publish music, um, which in retrospect is an awful thing to do because it's terrible to all the other composers. But what it meant was that they responded to that by producing a huge amount of music, including the Cantiones Sacre, which is collections of many, many Latin motets. And they were allowed to write in Latin because uh, technically it was writing for the Queen, and the Queen was known to understand Latin, and therefore it wasn't breaching the sort of Protestant ethos that you have to compose music in a language that must be understood by the people listening to it, because Latin could be understood by the people listening to it. So we have her to thank for the fact that many of the great Latin motets by those two composers were written. But dating back a little bit before her comes this motet by Tallis, If You Love Me, and that's, it's a, um, a classic example of the Edward VI style of music writing in English, very much homophonic, meaning that all the parts sing the words at exactly the same time for the most clarity possible. So at the beginning of this is very chordal. Then there's a small amount of counterpoint. It's fairly limited, it's maybe singing about two beats out of sync with other parts, but it's enough to remain clear. It didn't do what um, Latin Catholic style motets would do, um, which is to take one syllable and have a very long melisma, which is when you remain on one syllable, such as a, a, a particular vowel, and sing a long musical line before switching to the next syllable. That produces a lot of musical beauty. Um, but in the eyes of these strict monarchs, it didn't produce actual clarity of text. And there was a huge emphasis in Edward VI's time of clarity of text. So listen out to the types of texture in If You Love Me by Tallis, the way that the chords make the text as clear as possible, and the way that the counterpoint is 
quite restrained so as not to retract from, uh, sorry, detract from the clarity of the text when the parts aren't quite singing the words at the same time. So pause at this point and listen to the talis and then we'll come back to talk more about Stanford. Now, Charles Philip Stanford was a major composer in English music. He was actually Irish himself, but he uh, came to England to study music at Cambridge University, which uh, was a, an institution that ended up becoming a very important part of his later professional working life. Um, and at that point, music in this country was going through a bit of a dead period. So actually from around the late 18th century into the, the whole of the first half of the 19th century, um, it was in a pretty woeful state. And it was some of the Wesley family, Samuel Sebastian Wesley, his father, their relations to Charles Wesley, but quite a few generations later, they started to make a few moves to get church music and general music in this country working again um, when it's really waned. Um, and for example, the Samuel Sebastian Wesley anthem, Blessed Be the God and Father, which is now quite a well-known piece in church music. Um, there are some dire stories about how it was premiered at Worcester Cathedral by a row of a very small number of boys singing the top part and the bishop's butler singing the bass parts and no other singers at all. Um, so it's pretty sad to think of a staple piece like that having such a an undeserved, uh, undeservedly bad premiere. Um, but one of the main things that Stanford brought in was influence from the continent. And he is one of two major English, or, well, he wasn't English, was he? He was one of two major organists in this country who went to study in Leipzig in Germany, the other one being me. Um, and he went to Leipzig because the education offered at the Royal Academy of Music in London, which at that point was the only conservatoire operating, um, was considered very old-fashioned, rather, um, rather dry and uninspiring. So he went to Leipzig seeking a bit of continental verve, and the conservatoire there was founded, I believe, in the 1840s by Mendelssohn, to train uh, musicians for the Leipzig Gewandhaus Orchestra, which remains one of the top orchestras in Germany and the world. And um, Stanford went there expecting it to be a progressive place that would be a much better education for him uh, as a composer and musician than he would have got in London. And when he got there, he found the teacher even drier, even more dull and contemptuous about great composers of the day, such as Wagner and Brahms, this um, this teacher there called Reinecke uh, was even drier than he would have found in London. So this in some ways wasn't an inspiration to Stanford, but actually it made him search for something more. And some people credit his disdain for this very resentful composition teacher in Leipzig for sparking a bit of creativity, almost reactionary creativity in Stanford's compositional mind. Um, and so, although he may have felt disappointed by what he received in terms of education in Leipzig, it actually brought a lot of interesting thoughts to his mind. And he came back to Britain and became a major musical figure um, who had a level of influence in Germany through his contacts there. And when, when Stanford wrote symphonies, for example, this one called the Irish Symphony, and that was conducted by Hans von Bülow, who was... Um, really Brahms's main conductor in Hamburg and historically that looks like pretty a pretty great honour for a composer to have had and in fact the same symphony was also conducted by Marlowe in New York so these are really towering figures of music and at that point it was very very unusual for a British slash Irish composer to have any of that level of influence on the continent where music was thriving. And in fact, the composer who later eclipsed Stanford was Edward Elgar, who had that in common. Ed Elgar also had an influence on the continent, and that's very much how to add the certain gravitas and respect to one's music 
that would then give it more of a weighting and importance back in England. Anyway, Stanford then started to work in Cambridge um, and he was credited with turning the Cambridge University Musical Society into something of an international uh, reputation. And in fact, if you go on their website now, Cambridge University Musical Society, they say with great um, pride that they've premiered works by Brahms and then a list of other composers, but Brahms sort of sticks out as a casual mention of one of the great composers. Uh, and what they mean is that they gave the UK premiere of one of the Brahms symphonies in Cambridge. Um, and in fact, several major German musicians of the day came to work with the orchestra in Cambridge, and that was because of Stanford, major German musicians of the day. Then in 1883, it was thought that the Royal Academy of Music didn't train orchestral players to the level that was really desired. And so and that's nothing to do with how they operate today. I mean, I, <laughs> I went there uh, over the last couple of years, so I'm not going to knock them. Um, but back in the 19th century, clearly there was a, a level of uh, dissatisfaction with their training. So the Royal College of Music, easily confused, um, was set up. And that's the building that is opposite the Royal Albert Hall. Uh, with sort of gothic towers. It's sort of around Imperial College and the museum. Um, and Stanford became a professor of composition there. And many of the great composers of that day, or the younger ones, went to study with him and they found him very, very strict. He would mainly say whether he despised their music or whether he thought something was inspired, but it, it broke a lot of people. Um, but at the very least, it meant that the the German influence was then able to spread through England and that meant that classical music in this country was able to improve to a level that was comparable with the continent and through that composers such as Elgar, Parry, Herbert Howells and many others who are less famous, um, their music uh, had a, a kind of platform was, and was able to exist. So, although eventually Stanford's music largely went out of fashion, he was very much responsible for, um, for huge amounts of musical change and cultural change in this country, and perhaps doesn't always get the uh, thanks that he deserves for it. Uh, for example, he also taught on the music degree at Cambridge, uh, something that I did, and he, when he started his London position, he continued to teach in Cambridge, but he was a bit lazy about it. And he actually, he would take the train to Cambridge and then book a room at Cambridge Station and make the students come all the way to the station, which if you know Cambridge is not in the center of town and have their supervisions there, which they didn't appreciate very much. Um, he also did one thing. He made one change to something that's rather unthinkable today, which was apparently that in Cambridge at the time, the music degree, um, was almost optional and you could get the degree simply by taking the exams. You didn't have to do the three years of study. And Stanford put his foot down and made sure that that wasn't possible. The only way to get a music degree was very much by doing the three years of study, um, which seems what you'd expect, but uh, apparently they were evading that system at the time. So he had really a sweeping influence over music in this country. Um, but unfortunately for him, he's mainly known for his church music. Um, because that was really a very, very staple thing that brought, brought uh, the genre back to life. Whereas the other genres in which he worked, such as opera and symphonies and chamber music, well, they were all rivaled against what was written in the continent, in France and Germany and other countries. Um, so there was much stiffer competition. But the church music is very, very fine, and we have settings such as the anthem that we would have done, Oh for a Closer Walk with God. It's a very beautiful setting, very, very simple and uh, sweet to the ear, worth a listen. And then there's this Arnie Stay from the communion service in F which is something I didn't actually know until recently at St Saviour's when I was just searching online for a few free scores and found this actually exquisitely beautiful little army stage. So it's worth listening to a couple of 
uh, to those, those two pieces. Then for a bit of further listening from Stanford, when it came to the First World War, he was afraid of air raids, and so he moved out to Windsor and stayed at St George's in Windsor in the, in the castle. Um, and of course, being at war with Germany was a terrible thing for Stanford personally, because he had connections with Germany, so he couldn't simply think of them as the enemy. He, this was a place where he had gone for his education, made contacts, had his music performed, and all the rest. And he saw the First World War as Germany's betrayal of, of its own culture. He was really shocked by what they had to, decided to do. And his way of expressing that was to find a text from the Old Testament from the book of Habakkuk, so really delving pretty deeply into the Old Testament, into unfamiliar territory. And he found this text, For lo, I raise up a bitter and hasty nation. Um, and it's about an, in, it, it, it's one of Habakkuk's prophecies, it's about an invasive force that uh, takes over land and dwelling places that are not theirs. And he uses it very effectively with this uh, sprawling, violent and raging organ part and amazing use of text as well. It's all an allegory, of course, for the, uh, for the First World War. Interestingly enough, he didn't publish the piece when he wrote it in 1915, uh, not until 1939, so when exactly the same uh, thing was happening. Although I'd better check that, because I think he may have died before 1939. But uh, interesting if it was chosen by someone else to publish at that point, because of the significance of that year as well, for much the same theme. Um, so it begins with a violent telling of the story of the invaders, and then there's um, this much more calm and subdued section talking about God uh, as this figure who is above all the raging and just there as a source of peace and mercy above this almost insignificant uh, uh, battle that's going on on earth. And then there's a beautiful treble or soprano solo, I will stand upon my watch, which is amusing because if you've got an expensive watch then you shouldn't stand on it. So this moment, that chord for example, and the way it travels to the next, this is using so much German influence, it's just like moments in Mahler symphonies or things, just so much weight and so many connotations in the harmony and different twists and turns being taken all in the higher range of the piano as well so it's mixing simplicity with complexity um it's a very good microcosm of this germanic influence that stanford had that he brought into english music then there's a joke solo i call it a joke solo for the tenor just because it's only two bars long um and so getting awarded it is a little bit like being given a bonus at work for only two pounds. Um, and then that's followed by a final chorus in which there's a very different character to the writing and the choir sing for a message of peace. So this is the end of Stanford's message, converting this warmongery, if that's a word, into a new era of peace. And because this is allegorical, we can apply the idea to any situation, any different war, or even to a different enemy such as the coronavirus. Um, but this whole piece of music, it's around eight minutes or so, just summarises the influence that Stanford had on the music of this country um, by bringing in continental influences and the quality of the music there that hadn't suffered the sort of dead period that we'd had in this country. Finally, I'll put up a link to the Postlude in D minor for organ. It's a wonderful organ piece by Stanford that I would have played. Otherwise, just uh, let me know what you think. I hope you lis enjoy listening to these pieces of music, learning a little bit more about Charles Villas Stanford and his contribution to music in this country. And uh, let me know what you think. I'll put an email address in the description below. It's always nice to hear from people. And otherwise, have a great weekend and looking forward to hearing from you soon. Thank you.